coming. My name is Melissa Burroughs, and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of, of Equal Opportunity. I almost said our acronym first. Our acronym is OEO, so you'll hear me re refer to that as well. Um, so I'd like to welcome you today to our meeting. We try to hold these meetings quarterly, and uh, sometimes that works out for us, and sometimes we're just a little bit behind our schedule. But I also wanted to say to you that it's really an important concept for us. So as you're, we're going through this process today and the meeting today, if you think of other people who may want to come and speak um, as part of the series, um, just let me know. And we can make some arrangements for that as well. So um, I'd also like to stop and pause for a moment and just um, tell you the names of the people in our office, our staff. You probably have heard some of the names, but sometimes it's also good to um, see the people as well. I will ask the, the ones, um, OEO staff that are here to raise their hands, okay? So the first one, Michael Curry, Carol Whitaker, she's not here today, Jen Wyman, she's not here, Barbara Esperon, in the back, Jeremiah Triplett, Nora Singleton, Hank Swagger, Sandra Stack, and Andrew Bean. The mission of the Office of Equal Opportunity is really to advance equal economic benefit for all of Clevelanders. And the way that we assist in doing that is really by ensuring compliance with contractor goals and requirements. Also by providing development and supporting activities for targeted groups. And then also through this whole overall advocacy with a commitment to excellent public service. We also are part of this whole, the mayor's initiative and more importantly, uh, advancing self-help. Um, we, are, we, we are the advocates of self-help and the mayor has this prescribed model of understanding the community in these ways. So self-help really means that we will invest locally, buy locally, and hire locally. And those are really the, the fundamental things that we really concentrate all of our efforts of towards. So again, I want to say thank you for coming today. Um, and I want to pause also as part of this conversation. Sometimes it's really important for other people to know who's in the room. And I'm going to ask um, our uh, businesses that are located here in the room to, if you could just say your name and the name of your business. Um, I think that would also help as well. There's always an opportunity to network. And so I'm going to start with you, sir. Hello, my name is Lyle Van Leer, and the name of my business is Van Van Commercial Residential. Hi, I'm Laura Jessica. I own MJP Trucking. We're a construction dump truck hauling company. Growing a little bit every year. This is my third, is my third construction season, the second year of business. Hi, my name is Renice. My business is Renice's Quality Cleaning Services. Let me show you what cleaning really means. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tina Gahan with Green Rock Lighting, uh, and we're a premier LED lighting manufacturer in Cleveland going for the street lighting program that's up in the city. Thank you. I'm Nancy Zoller, and I work with Tina. Hi, I'm Shante Bowe. I'm Shante Bowe. I have two companies. One is um, Body Stay Crew, which is a residential um, commercial cleaning company, and then Intuitive Risk Management International, um, where I am a business strategist and management consultant. No, no, ladies first. Hi, I'm Brianna Parker. I'm the president of D.E. Williams Electric, uh, newly put in. Um, we are an electrical company providing all types of electrical services, low voltage, high voltage, UPS, you name it, we do it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dennis Clark. I am a dynamics engineering. We are a mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and technology engineering firm. One of the things I'm proud to say is we are celebrating our 20th year in business in July of this year. So, so thank you. And, um, you can just name, say your name and your business. Oh, my name is Colleen Griffin. Um, the name of my company is CCR Management. Um, we specialize in nothing and excavating, and I'm a local and your business owner. And I have two directors here, and you, I'll introduce them shortly. So thank you. I, it, again, it's always, there's always an opportunity to network and, and know each other in terms of our businesses. Um, so at this time, I'm going to uh, introduce Joe Lopez. Um, but first, let me uh, 
give you a little bit of background for the Joe. He's, he's always, he's very modest. <laughs> so he's saying to me in his eyes, don't read this information. But I think it's really important to read it. I'm gonna read it. I have, I have editor's rights here today. <laughs> um, so Mr. Joe Lopez, he's from Portage Synergetics in Akron. Um, serves as a chemical sales manager with the distinction of top sales professional for five years, top 2% nationally for three consecutive years. He's also president and CEO of such companies as New Air Builders Incorporated, it's Cleveland based, it's a commercial general contractor contracting firm. Sierra Metals Incorporated at Las, from Las Vegas, Nevada, and also Aster Elements Incorporated, uh, again, from Cleveland. Both of those two companies are architectural, metal, cladding, contractors, designers, fabricators, and installing installation or installing firms. Mr. Lopez has worked on numerous contracts throughout the city of Cleveland, such as e Eaton World Headquarters, University Hospitals, Cleveland Art Museum, the Cleveland Hopkins International Airport, Cleveland Convention Center, our Hilton Hotel, Aloft Hotel, and Red Cross. Additionally, Mr. Lopez has worked throughout the United States and is now expanding his reach internationally. When we met with him, he said he was going to work in Dubai. And I said, please stay. Getting there. I've been there and done that. So see, we have something to look forward to to hear more about. So again, let's welcome Mr. Joe Lopez. I can tell you that um, I'm flattered and I'm nervous. Okay, so give me a little bit of breathing room on this. Um, the reason I say that is because when I started my business, I have my notes, but I think I may go off cue. And I think it's important because I want to speak from the heart. When you guys come out here today, it means a lot that you really care about being successful. I read all the books, went out to the seminars, did all the videos, and after all of that, I said, what I really want to be? And I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And most of you that are in the field or in, in the audience, you know, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? The great hours, the great pay, no pressure, no responsibilities, all the vacation time you want? No. You do it because you're, you have the capabilities. You have what it takes on the inside. So when I look at the audience, and I know it's, it's crappy weather. We may have to edit some of this, these words. But it's crappy weather outside, and we're doing everything we can to do. I, was, I started this morning 7.15 at a project this downtown Cleveland. Went out to beach, went, had a meeting, came back downtown. You do what's, what's required, okay? And because there is a requirement in your, in your career, there are about 10 rules that you really should consider. And I call this, and um, it's funny because I met with Dr. Burroughs, and I said, it's called reflection to direction. And he said, oh, that's really great. Reflection to direction. And I meant that, and it was just off the cuff. I said, you really have to reflect what you want to be, what you're capable of, and embrace it. You know, I never thought 29 years ago when I started my company um, that I would have the opportunities that lay in front of me. Um, I'm in the final negotiations of consulting with a business that potentially next year could do $500 million per year. I'm also in, in, a, in a process of negotiating with a UAE in Dubai, and that is larger. I'm a little nervous about that because we're a small firm and you have to count on resources and relationships. Unfortunately, I don't have any relationships or any references in Dubai. And I've heard a lot of horror stories. You know, it's great, there's a lot of capital, there's a lot of cash, but there's a lot of unknowns. Some of the unknowns make me nervous, should make everybody nervous here. But I think that some of the things that we should do is that you need to have a vision of your company. I got about 10 steps. The vision of your company, there's no mystery. You want to know the future of your company. It's critical that the owner must have clarity, know what you want to be, that's a reflection, and then be able to embrace that. The second part I think you want to do is you want to have the leadership the vision of the leadership. How do you want to manage your company? What's the culture you want to create? And I look in the audience and, you know, most of us start by ourselves. You count on yourself. 
That's the leadership that you start with. That is the culture that you want other people to buy into what you want. You know, they have to mimic you. Energy, talent, resources, tenacity, whatever it is. That's what makes you successful. The third part, I think, is you want to provide ongoing education and training. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. And if just two weeks ago, I still go to seminars, I go to this training, and I'm in a training seminar, and it was an outreach. And a uh, guy, it was an MBE for, it was mostly MBEs, Hispanics and African Americans, and we're trying to do some work with uh, a large state organization. I'll leave it there. And the guy was saying, you know what? Every time I train my people, I make investments, and I teach them you know, computer skill sets, and I treat them AutoCAD, and estimate, and stuff like that, then you guys come around and you take them. You steal them. <laughs> and it was like a pin drop in a room. I went like, my God, make lemonade from this lemon. So I called the guy over and I said, listen, you know what? That was the worst thing you could have said. Because that's all you said. You could have said, don't you like our people? That's the rest of my staff. Why don't we engage and move on? Let's try to form a collaboration. And after he said that, he goes, I think I screwed up. I go, go back there and talk to those guys there and say, yeah, you have more. You can steal more or you can collaborate. You need us, we need you. And the guy went, like, you're right, Joe. I go, like, you got to listen to what you're thinking and what you're saying before you say it. I think the other part that's really important, number five, is communicate your goals daily. When I was in a field, and I could tell you, everybody knows what shot creating is. So you get a big hose, you have concrete coming out, right? And you're shot creating. That's what that is. And I remember going to a project that was in Canton, Ohio. We we're doing it for a school system. And I went there, and I was on the end of the hose. It's hard, it's dangerous, it's violent, it's loud. And I'm the end of the hose, and the other guys are beside me, behind me. And I said, guys, this is our goals. We have X amount of dollars, and if we do this, we're gonna make money. And if we do this, there's another opportunity to get another project, another project. <coughs> I communicated that at the breakfast meeting, at the lunch meeting, at the break, and the following days. They knew the goals. We communicated those goals on a regular basis. They knew what it took to win. No different than what LeBron does. Or he gets paid a whole lot more than I do. <laughs> but he has the same goals. He talks to them, he gets them huddled up, he has a common goal, and he says, let's execute. And if it doesn't work, I guarantee you, half time, he's talking to them again, reinforcing the goals, and then he executes it. The other part, I think, is that it goes to number seven, which is developing strong leaders within your, current, within your current company. The strong leaders that we talk about are people that can carry the message when you're out developing new relationships, or when the leaders are there and you're not there, that they're communicating that upstream to the owner. I can't tell you how many times that I would go to meetings and uh, I'd have to go, go off the job site to a project meeting or something like that. And I have Johnny and Billy and Jose and Miguel and all these other guys there. And the owner walks by and I go like, oh my God, I hope they don't talk to him. Because I, at the time, I didn't know how important it was to have the leaders step up and give the same message. We're here, we want to perform, we're going to be very safe, we're going to meet your, your schedule, your deadlines, we're going to exceed your expectations. That's what they be, should be saying. I didn't know that, and those are some of the things uh, in my 29, year 29 years of experience that I come away with. Now, you have a spokesperson or two, they have the same message, and they're going to share it upstream. I'm going to tell you why that's important when we come back to it. I also want to talk to you about a create a sense of urgency, not emergency. Big difference. Urgency, we want to perform. We don't want to screw up and then hurry up and overcome. That thing, that's a bad way to, build, to have a business plan. You wouldn't have it in a business plan. Or emergency, things will blow up, how to correct it. You need to have an opportunity to share that urgency. 
The other thing I, we talk about is really an incentive program. I'm not sure how many guys have bonuses, okay? Bonuses are only for those individuals or entities that do above what's expected, not the norm, not the norm. You show up at 7.30, work to 3.30, you don't get a bonus. You're lucky you have a job, because I could probably find more guys that'd be there at 7.15. The bonus program that if you have one, I'll tell you what I learned about two weeks ago doing some voluntary work with a bunch of guys, a bunch of successful um, business owners. And we're talking and we're doing some brush cleaning and some cutting some trees and stuff like that for a nonprofit entity. And he said, Joe, he says, uh, how do you get your people? I said, well, you know, we advertise, just word of mouth, you know, we have skill sets. Um, I said, how do you get your people? He goes, we don't advertise. I go, how many people do you have in your company? He goes, 45. I go, they're CNC operators and they're very high tech. I go, how do you get them? How do you keep them? He says, Joe, let me tell you what we do. We have a bonus program. I said, I'm all ears. I'm listening to the chainsaw, but I'm all ears. I'm listening to you. He says, this is what we do. He goes, we give them three opportunities. If they're late, one time, they, they get a third of their bonus. He goes, they're late the second time into 12 months, two strikes. Third strikes, they get no bonus. I go, what happens to that money? He goes, we split it up, 45 people, 44 people, 43, 42. So as long as you're showing up on time performing, you're eligible, if the company is, performs, they get a bonus. I says, how does that work? He says, second year, no one was ever late. That's a pretty good incentive, bonus. It's above, everyone is expected to be, on, be there on time. It doesn't happen. You know, like today, weather's, Dumpy, you guys are here. If I had a bonus, I'd give it out to all of you because you did what it took, above what it took. That's important. I think the last one is really encouraging and plan and execution. That to me is like, you know, you gotta plan. It's like when you go on a road trip, you wanna know where you're gonna go, how you're gonna get there, how many tolls it takes, do you have the resources, do you have a reliable car? I laugh every time I see a car on the side of the road with a guy in the rain with a gas can. I go like, you dummy. <laughs> Didn't you know that, you, that, that meter says empty, half, or full? You're riding in the rain, you think that you know, you're gonna get there when it's not empty? No, pull over. There's no planning. You gotta plan to work. You gotta communicate the work. You gotta educate your people what you wanna do and then you gotta do it. I'll tell you a couple of things that I think that were milestones in my career, personal accomplishments that I could go back. Now, 29 years, there's a lot of things I forgot. There's a lot of things I'm still reinventing. I think the first thing is don't be a commodity. I do business counseling for, for people and for firms. And I remember just two weeks ago, a person gives me their, their form, they go like this, they go, Joe, this is what I do. No, and it had this side and this side of everything. And it was electrical contractors. I know there's a couple electrical guys here, D.E. Williams and some LED light people. I do this, this, and 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 this. I go, what do you do with this? He goes, well, I give it to people. I go, bad idea. And I went like this. I go, we're not gonna do that anymore. They go, oh my God, that's my marketing. I go, that's not real good marketing because it's not working. Don't be a commodity. Be special, be different, be best of class, be the subject matter expert in your division. I will tell you a, a story. I went, to, I went to Las Vegas a couple years ago and I was helping a firm that wanted to grow their business. They did about $700,000 their first year. I said, guys, there's a lot of work out here because we can't get it. I actually bought into the company, took majority shares, 51%, certified it as an MBE firm, Hispanic owned, and our second year we did $14 million. 700,000 to 14 million the second year. And how did we do it? We had a vision, we had a direction, we had accountability, and we marketed it. And we marketed as a, we were the very best because we had Midwest work ethics. 
We worked hard, we worked smart, and we executed. I hate to say we weren't like the guys from California, and we weren't like the travelers from Las Vegas. When they wanted something done, we got it done, and we executed. We could have continued to grow the company until MGM in Dubai, the city center that started as a $3 billion, $3 billion project ended up being $9 billion. And there was a time there that, believe it or not, MGM in Dubai didn't have any money. They didn't know the direction they were going in. And they were asking all the subcontractors to take a haircut. What a haircut is, you're owed X amount of dollars and they want to pay you 15, 20%, 30%, 40%, 80%, whatever it is. But they don't want to pay you what you're entitled to. And, and I protested. I said, no freaking way. We outperformed, we outdelivered, quality of work, we're not taking a haircut. Everyone took a 35% cut. We took 1%. And I said, I'll rip it off the building. I didn't care. That's our Midwest mentality. We earned it. We're I don't say entitled. I hate that word. But we earned it. When you're going out there and you're marketing your skill sets, you have to show that you're different, you're better, you perform out of the box, etc. What I started to share, share with you before is that when you're on the job site, whatever company it is, engineering, electrical, mechanical, paint, painting, etc., like that, you have to have that message go upstream. And this is what I tell people. I've been a subcontractor, I've been a general contractor. I was a general contractor at NASA Glenn for six years, I had two extended contracts. We built a rocket test facility. Don't tell me how we're turning it on. Don't tell me how to shut it off. But I know how to assemble a rocket test facility. I also worked on, at the Eaton World Headquarters. You saw it in 271. It was the largest architectural project in the city of Cleveland. I did it my first year in business. I assembled the team, knew it better than anybody else. And the reason I say we, do, we knew it better because we collaborated and when we, when we market it, I'll tell you how we market it. Eaton is a great corporate partner. Phenomenal. They had an outreach seminar. And they had a contractor there, and they had all of the PR people from Eaton, everybody else. And after the presentation, they're showing this beautiful building. It's gorgeous. I had my portfolio with me. So after we meet, we talk, and I go, hey, I see you have a lot of architecture metal. Let me see. Let me show you what we did. What we're capable of. They went, God is my witness, and said, we want this company on our job site. That's all it took. We had, we were vetted out, we knew where we were going, and we could deliver. I still remember that day. It was a great project for us. Actually, the architect now has a table, a coffee table book that they have in their architectural offices of our work. I saw it, but I didn't buy the book because they have a thousand other pictures that are real, that are, you know, are different. Joe, yes? What did you, you just showed him your pictures of your work? And that got us to the second meeting. That caught his attention and he could talk about Yep. And we're going to have questions and answers because there's so much stuff that you know, we've experienced over the years. So we talked about standing out from your competitors, be approachable, have references, be vetted out, um, and have it be the subject matter expert. We were the only guys in town in our first year we did that. The same year, we also did the Cleveland Art Museum. And when they set the standards, they said, these are all the standards. This is the art museum standard up here. And it's a tough project. If you go there, it's beautiful, world class. We were able to be part of that. We're proud of that, that, that opportunity. Another thing that we talk about, when I was running the company in the field, I always liked to have our subcontractors, and we would have a huddle. 
And the huddle was to share what our expectations were. Truck drivers, painters, electrical contractors, LED cleaning. And we would talk to them. And we were doing MOUs before they were popular. We had memory of understandings of like what we're trying to accomplish as a team. And we were all supportive of each other. And it was so important so that if I had you on my job site and your, one of your employees was causing problems, I'd be calling you direct. I'd go, listen, you're one of your people here. Like, they don't understand what we're talking about. Our understanding, you need to straighten them out. And if you didn't straighten them out, first of all, I'd let you know. I expected you to do the right thing for our understanding to move forward. And if you didn't, um, first of all, I would say, I don't want them back. I hate to say this, sometimes there were union people, I said, you can't get rid of me. I said, watch, watch me. You don't get what we're trying to accomplish as a team. More than once, actually it only happened on one job, I spoke to the president, he said, I'll handle it. Two days later, guy came back, like everybody, and he apologized to everybody. I know I've been stupid and I was this and that, but I said, listen, forgiven. Let's move on, let's do what we gotta do. The other thing that, we, that I used to do is that the subcontractors, we had them sharing. We had to share them services. Now you can't do that all the time because that has a lot of uh, jurisdiction to the unions and stuff like that, but we shared. We said, listen, you're a laborer, I don't need you eight hours a day, I, can you do this over here and vice versa. When they need a lift, they'll share a lift with you and we shared those resources. And the understanding I had with the owners of the company is that I'll let you make money and I'll pay you early, but you have to perform. If you don't perform, I don't care how low your price is. I don't want you. You talk about ownership, you talk about um, compliance. That was really important for us. And we would keep some of the same teams, 16 and 17 years, on, engaged. It wasn't about price, it was about performance. One of the things that I want to talk about, which is really odd, is that uh, when you're bidding jobs, you'd be surprised how we used to just get, we would put out projects you know, on the public website or the bulletin boards and people log on and builders exchange. We used to fax out, that's how old that was, right? A long time ago we used to fax stuff out. And people would fax their prices in, and then we'd do scope review. You'd be surprised the minimum amounts of phone calls that people would say, did you get my proposal? Can we talk about it? Can I come and meet with you? Zero. However, when we were bidding a job, we would make sure that we went face to face, we'd go over the drawings, and if we couldn't get an introduction, a one-on-one, -on -one, we knew that they were, they were not really engaged with the subcontractors. They had their own crew. That's fine. But if we gave you a proposal, we expected feedback. We expected it. We needed it. And that's how we grew. Because we were only make the same mistakes again and again and again and, and try to get a different expectations or results. So we talked to them. If they didn't want to see us, didn't want to talk to us, we said, Pff, we got another invite, I don't care, throw it away. Tell them, tell my estimate, tell them we don't want to work with them. Are you crazy? No, tell them we don't want to work with them, but we're going to be on that project, and they won't be. They go, oh, what does that mean? Said, well, we wanted them to have the same respect. Our efforts, our energy, our resources, we put it into win the job, not to give it to them so they could comparative shop. Wouldn't do it. Would not do it, I wouldn't do it today. I won't do it today. If you want to be engaged with us and have something that, that is of value in the relationship, we're moving on. One of the things we, we talked about a little bit was upstream and downstream. Upstream is when you're working for the owner, downstream is your subcontractors working for you. You'd be surprised when we had our subcontractor meetings and we would talk to them that the owner and the upstream guys was, would listen like, really good stuff, Joe. How do you get those guys to do that? I says, we, we pay them early. We pay them early because 
you're going to pay us on time, and we'll float it. Now, if we're not performing, they're not performing, there's a big gap, there's a big, gap, there's a big delta. But you got to take that chance, and you have to perform. Talk about blind emails and proposals. We wouldn't do it, and I, I encourage you guys not to do it. In fact, I'll probably give you some of these notes later. Um, networking, if you're a sub on a project, and this is what I would say about networking. If you're a subcontractor and you're on a project and the project is very successful, very unique, one of a kind, I encourage you to go and talk to the owner if the job is successful after the fact. After the fact, you don't need permission from your general contractor unless they preclude, preclude you. I would go back to those guys there. I still do work for the art museum. Not on the contract with, this, with the general contractor. I work direct now. They liked what we did, they appreciated it, they embraced it. And I would encourage anyone that does that, now, if you can provide a service to the contractor, or the owner, do it. Call them, say, hey, you know all this, this grounding that we did for the electrical stuff, there? that we did all that stuff. Remember right, guys? Yeah, we did all that stuff. Great. I have a project that I'd like to get you guys involved with directly. Thank you. Can I have another? Tell you something else that we did that was very different and unique, and we're proud of this. We, I just share with you, we had a relationship with our subcontractors. At Eaton World Headquarters, we had a lot of geometry. It's curved, it's radius, it's tilted, it's very difficult geometry. And our AutoCAD guys were very good. What we ended up doing is that we had shirts printed, and with some of the most difficult engineering, we made t shirts of it. And I tell you what, on the back of it, it said Eaton World Headquarters, Architecture Metal um, Extraordinary, or whatever it was. Some verbiage. It was good verbiage. I don't remember what it was, but it was good at the time. And I gave that to all the guys that were working on the job site. And we gave it upstream to the project managers, and actually a couple of Eaton guys got it too. They said, wow, look, these are the guys. This, that's, our, that's our facade. Yeah, that's it. Very unusual. We were the only guys that did that. So again, we were different, unique. NASA Glenn. The rocket test facility called Smurf, small multi-purpose facility. We did the same thing. On that one, we had all the subcontractors. We had excavators, we had the control people, we had the structural steel guys, we had new era builders, we had all these guys there. And all those guys, that was one of a kind project. They have a shirt. Because they can't get on, on property any longer because of security, but they, they could say, hey, listen, I worked on that project. It was kind of cool. Again, a little different, a little unique at the time, just thinking out of the box. Um, one of the things we talked about with our guys in the field is that, excuse me, don't bitch, don't complain, don't point fingers, don't spread rumors. Don't do it. Because that'll, that'll leach out of your group and it'll go to management, it'll go to the upstream contractor or the owner, and that's a reputation. You know, don't say anything, don't point fingers. No smoking, no cussing, behave. And if you didn't, we find a way to get rid of you. Um, if you're miserable, you're toxic. And if you're toxic, good luck trying to get it on that job again. Good luck and try to manage the relationships with someone else. Don't go to that guy, the trouble, that company's trouble. You know all those guys there that were hot riding or spinning their tires, whatever it is. Your employees are relationship of your, are representation of the relationship that you want to create. And here's the last thing that I want to talk about. And this is controversial, and I put in bold, controversial. Don't lead with your status. Lead what you want to market. You're ready, you're willing, you're able, you're qualified, you're the subject matter expert, you're seasoned, you're local, you're flexible, and you happen to be a certified MBE, certified FBE. We never, ever, ever led with our certification. It was always at the back of our package. We show them why, who, 
performance, everything else like that. And we put us in there because we didn't know how they wanted to use us. But we're going to find a way. Um, the last part that I would say is that uh, reflection and direction is important. One last thing I want to sh or share with you. We worked on the Trump Tower in Las Vegas. We didn't give shirts out, we gave plaques. Donald Trump, the president, has a plaque that we gave to him when we were in Las Vegas years ago. It's a little bit different, okay? So when you can, you try to have those firms and those CEOs and presidents speak downstream like those guys are really good. They were sincere, they were sensitive, and they got it. And we're proud of what, the, what we have. Um, the last part I want, I want to share with you is that um, if I could only read my last writing. You know what? I hate when I do this. But there's a quote that is um, actually it's quoted right down there under because uh, this is the women's exhibition and it talks about that the air in the sky does not judge it really doesn't you know you get perform the best you can and you're not discriminated you, you work on performance and I think that's what's really important for all the firms in Cleveland this is a great city and there's so much more coming down the pike. You have to be ready, you have to be willing and able, and you really need to sit and talk to the people that make the decisions. Blind emails, blind proposals, that's not the way to do it. Get in front of the people, talk to them, find out what makes them interested in engagement, and fulfill that part. I'll have questions and answers afterwards. Um, thanks for tolerating me. <laughs> Oh, here, here's my quotes on my business card. <laughs> the air is the only place free from prejudice. All right, and that's from uh, Bessie Coleman. I just read that over there just today. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. Anyway, questions and answers. Floor is open. Yes, sir. So when you've been trying to grow your capacity, what's been the easiest way, or maybe lessons learned from? trying to add staff, whether it be construction staff or anywhere else. Um, we have a lot of small businesses and a lot of large projects. And so it's a matter of if you are a small business that you have your staff, how, do you, how can you increase capacity when you just need more people? And what are, what are lessons you've learned from trying to add people like that? Well, I think part of it is that you have to understand what your limitations are, whether it's capital, Financing it, okay, or just talent. If you have capital, you can always hire talent. If you have talent and relationship, you can always find the capital. If you had neither one, good luck, okay? So my very first employee, believe it or not, was an architect. I was a one-man shop. And the first one I hired was an architect because I knew that I had to be specified or I needed to have better skills that I couldn't draw I mean, I could draw, but I mean, it'd be like crayons. You know, I mean, I'm good, but not like an architect that could do AutoCAD. So I knew that my very first employee had to be an architect. And then I, did, I pressed him. I said, if you can't do it all, who do you know that can do some part-time work? That's exactly how we started. They went to part-time work, and we hired them, 1099. Okay? When we needed them, we brought them on board, gave us some services, and we didn't. That was okay. Eventually, we had enough. We hired a second architect had two architects and me. And then we continued on. Then I needed a project manager. So part of it, I think, is like having one core pillar, get another one. Before you know it, you're building a foundation of a company. As long as they understand what the deliverables have to be, 
I don't think there's, there's any challenges out there. There are some challenges where the contractor doesn't want to debundle, right? Big project. Right now in the industry, they have a building envelope package. That's it. Roofing, glazing, metal. That's typical. Or stone. Or, you know, that's a building envelope. So what you need to do is you need to create relationships and partnerships. We do it. We find out what projects are coming down, where our, what's the design going to be, and then how do we get in line to figure out have they selected someone to do a design build or budget preparation? And if not, we're the subject matter experts. We'll tell you what we think it's going to cost. How do we get engaged? Normally, if you're in on the base of the project, in the negotiations and design, you're halfway there because you've done all this work. They're not going to kick you out. Typically not unless you really mess up. But it's an, it's an investment. It's time, it's money, and you can't recoup it. You cannot recoup that time investment. So figure that's the cost of doing business. Sometimes you win, most of the times you win, but there's sometimes that you, that you eat it. The other part about it is that what we would try to do, and this is a suggestion I would make, is try to have a collaboration where you're not competing with someone, but you're joining forces, even if it's for one project at a time. Say, so, hey, listen, I'm a truck driver, I don't have four trucks, they need 12. You got six, and he's got a couple over here. Can we do this together maybe one time? And this is the rules of the policy. It's an engagement. You do this, I do this. If you don't do it, you can, and, it and it's fair for everybody. You could be replaced. That's a partnership. It could do that for painters. I know painters that do that. They say, listen, we're very good at spray painting, but you know, and you guys are very good at doing staining or whatever. Carpenters do it. Different trades do it because they only have a specific skill sets. For them to say they could do everything, it's no different than that piece of paper. I can do it all. Bull. You can't. Know your, know your lane, stay in your lane. Next. Bob. You, Mr. Painter. Oh, yeah, I like that. I, I like that. And this is who I am. That's, that's the marketing part, right? <laughs> it's time for that. I hope you got one for everybody. There you go. Any other questions? Joey, in the market itself here in Greater Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, what if your business, as good as you have your lane going, is not drawing business because the industry is still cottage and it is unwilling to expand either for finances or for talent. You know, you're create. I know what you what you do. You do. Um, I, I don't want to ruin it. Go ahead. You do. <laughs> you you demolish architecture for assets deconstruction. See how long have we talked? Has it been. Ten years. Ten years ago, deconstruction. You made, a, you made an impression on me, the deconstruction. Okay. Some markets will embrace that because they know the value of architecture and history. And some markets will really do that. Others, they don't want to spend the money. They'd rather knock it down and move on. Okay. So to answer your question, how do you penetrate or do a conversion? Okay. I think you have to do one at a time. Okay. Unless there is government incentives or local incentives, historical in incentives, tax breaks incentives. That's what gets people going. Mm -hmm. Show them the money and they'll find a way to get there. But if there's no money, they'll probably go a little bit differently. And that's a tough part because I love architecture. I think most people here don't want to knock down buildings, but you know what? A developer doesn't care sometimes. Faster knock it down and just move on. That, that's a tough one. Because the early Adapters are guys like you and I, okay? We're the early adapters. Mainstream guys may not get there for a while. It may take, it may be forced to be, to get there, unfortunately. Someone else had a hand. That's it. All right, guys, thank you so much. Okay, so what did I hear on it? Be special, be different, be unique.
be the subject matter expert. So thank you, Joe, and we'll come back up for some additional questions afterwards. This time I'd like to move into um, more a couple of different directors coming up and talking to you about potentially some upcoming contracts, um, or more importantly, what we're doing um, in the city of Cleveland. So the first director I'd like to invite up is uh, Director Mar Matt Sprons. He is the director of the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects, or MOCAP. And I always say and stop and pause for a moment. We see each other, but it's important to actually read bios, too. He's, see, again, I'm using this editorial right and privilege here. So Matt Sprons um, joined at Jackson Administration in November of 2013 as the director of uh, Office of Capital Projects, or MOCAP. As director, he provides for planning, designing, construction, and preservations of the City of Cleveland's facilities and infrastructure, all through collaborative, comprehensive planning, leadership and management, excellence and sustainable design, and technical expertise, all with the quality of con construction based on integrity and professionalism. Director Sprons is a licensed professional engineer and professional project manager with over 15 years of experience in the design, management, and construction of many large and complex projects and facilities within private sector industry and government as well. So please welcome Director Matt Sprons. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Matt Sprons. I'm the Director of Mayor's Office of Capital Projects. And I just want to explain to you um, what the Capital Office does. Our, our um, group is, it has basically four large divisions, the Division of Architecture and Site Development, uh, and they're responsible um, for all the buildings, rec centers, and uh, police, uh, you know, police uh, facilities, uh, fire stations throughout the city. Uh, and then also in that group is the Site Development Group. Um, they do all the parks and, and all our open spaces. Uh, they do all the design uh, for those types of facilities. Um, my other division is Engineering and Construction. Um, the engineering division does all the design uh, for all the bridges and roads in the city of Cleveland, uh, which we have quite a few of. And then also in that group is my construction management group. Uh, they, they manage to do all the construction management and uh, cost estimating and inspection uh, for, for our construction projects. Um, and then we have a survey department that does all the surveying for the city, uh, and they keep all the survey records for the city. Um, uh, some of you may, may have to use their services for, for some of your projects. Um, and then we have a, um, uh, a sidewalks bureau, uh, which kind of enforce um, the, the, the uh, right-of-way codes or the ordinances outside the curb line along the road and, and make sure everyone's in compliance with what's in the right-of-way. Uh, and then we also have a real estate division, and our real estate group um, uh, manages a lot of the um, real estate that we either have to buy or sell to to, to get pro projects moved forward. Um, so some of the opportunities we have coming up, our architecture group um, is working on uh, drawings for a new Ward 1 rec center. Um, so that's another project that should be coming out to bid next year. It's currently in design. Um, we're doing some expansion um, to the Ken Johnson rec center, which is a, a existing rec center uh, in uh, Ken Johnson's ward. Um, but that's a fairly large project that will be uh, coming out next year um, for again for uh, for bidding, uh, and um, we're also doing uh, some large expansions or renovations to Central Rec Center. Um, so that that project will be coming out to bid probably again next year. Uh, you'll see bid documents come out for that one, and then we're also repairing. I'll do a lot of capital improvements um, to a lot of about uh, 63 to 67 uh, different buildings, rec centers, fire stations. And these are, might be a little bit smaller projects. It might be anywhere from like $300,000 down to maybe like $50,000, but these are like capital repairs. So uh, Division of Purchasing and Supplies through Cle City of Cleveland will be posting these jobs. So some of those jobs might, you know, if you're a smaller business, you want to get in on some of these smaller projects, a lot of those should be coming out soon. Um, our, my site development group is currently working on about six new parks. Um, so um, we have a, a new plan where we're going to start to redevelop some of our older parks in the city. Um, and those will be probably like a million to $2 million per each park. Um, so you'll see a lot of projects coming out next year and, and over the next two, three years, um, re redeveloping a lot of our park infrastructure in the city. 
Um, that's one of the mayor's visions and goals is to is to get the park system and the neighborhoods, you know, more more enhanced uh, services into the neighborhoods. Um, so you'll see those projects coming out. And then in engineering, um, we we currently have um, a lot of work uh, going on. Um, in our road system, um, we generally do 30 million to 70 million a year in road and bridge projects. Um, I brought everyone a list of our current engineering projects, uh, road and bridge projects that are, are either in design or be out to construction this year. Um, so I'll pass these out for you and you can look for, uh, this one has all the bid dates on it uh, so you can see when those projects will be bidding. Um, and so um, I just wanted to go over that with you. And, and that's kind of what my department does. I'll be available at, uh, for questions afterwards if you want to talk to us. Um, also, you're, if you're an engineering firm, you know, we hire a lot of engineering firms, so if you can give me your contact information so as we send out requests for proposals for design services for these projects, we can get you on the mailing list, and then you can give us proposals for the work. Um, and so with that, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I think it, it does help to actually um, be able to see a face um, and a name and also then know which department in the city of Cleveland each of these directors are responsible for. So now I'm going to move over to economic development um, and the director is um, interim director uh, David Ebersole and again David I'm going to read your bio as well. Uh, David Ebersole is the interim director of economic development. Previously he served in the department of economic development as the Brownfield Program and Special Projects Manager. Director Ebersole has a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Carnegie Mellon University and a JD Juris Doctorate from Case Western Reserve University. And he's also a licensed attorney. Director Ebersole's responsibilities at the city include oversight of the city's economic development programming, management of the, the city's $250 million development loan portfolio, and assisting businesses and development in the city with their future growth needs. At this time, I'd like to um, welcome Director Ebersole. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming, and I uh, hope I have some good information for you. Um, in the city of Cleveland, we really try to value and work with our small and mid-sized businesses. That's really the core of our economy, um, and we know that the work that is being done out there is really what generates wealth and entrepreneurship for, for our residents. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different things today. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of our program, um, what we're seeing coming out in the um, development community over the next year. Um, I'm going to cover a handful of things that I have heard from the development community um, that may be useful for you. Um, and then I'm going to cover what resources we have that you may see in your business um, that may be an opportunity for you to work with us directly to finance some of your growth needs. So, um, on the programming side, last year we assisted projects with a total investment of about $200 million. Um, the year before that, we did project, we were on projects that were uh, close to $800 million. So, you can see a little bit some years you have a big project, some years you have smaller projects, but there's, you know, in the in total in the last two years, that's a billion dollars in projects in Cleveland that just includes projects that we helped finance. So there's private sector projects in addition to go on out there. So there's a lot of market out there. So how do we try and get into that market? Um, it's important that we can build with contract, our contractor base to provide services um, for those projects. Um, and uh, you know, at the city of Cleveland, we have programming. We have uh, uh, requirements to, for local hiring. We have requirements for um, use of minority, female, and Cleveland small businesses. So having a strong contractor base in that MBEFB CSB community, not only is it good for you, it's good for us. It makes our job a lot easier. It's good for our uh, clients that we work with. Um, coming up this year, we, we see there's um, a handful of projects coming out of the ground of significant scale. Um, you've probably seen IBM's Explorers building. It's going to be going up in Fairfax neighborhood. Um, that's a $15 million, $20 million project. Um, coming up now out of the ground is the first phase of the Link 59 at 59th and uh, Euclid Avenue. University Hospitals is going to be uh, starting construction on a building there. They're putting bids out. 
um, and there's a, another building that probably is going to be coming out in the fall. Um, just last couple weeks ago, we announced uh, Mayor Jackson's Neighborhood Transformation Initiative. As part of that program, we're looking to drive uh, $40 million in development funding. We're looking at another $20 million to go into new housing. Um, so there's a so that's going to start coming online again um, in the fall. We're expecting to issue RFPs for development here in the next month or so. So those will be projects that probably will be coming out to bid to start construction August September. Um, that's probably another you know I would say 20 25 million dollars pushing out into the market. Um, centric development is getting going. That's in uh, Little Italy University Circle. Um, that that project is also probably. Uh, getting started, we just closed on our financing piece on that. So those are just a handful of the projects that I have in the pipeline today that are projects of scale. That's, and that's projects of scale. It's ignoring, and that doesn't even mention, there's dozens of projects out there that might be half a million dollars, a million dollars that people are constantly looking out to all the time. So what are the things that I've heard in working with people? What are the things that I've noticed that are causing problems? What are the things that, uh, the piece of advice I can give you? Well, I think. I don't want to steal Joe's thunder because I think he did a tremendous job talking about it, but I think it's really important. These are contractor community, uh, the general contractor community, development community is not that big of a community, right? And everybody knows each other. So if you do a good job, the word gets around, you get more jobs. Um, number one, number one criteria. Number, um, you know, for working with um, our side, you know, working with government, working with Director Burroughs and her office, and how to facilitate with con um, how to facilitate, facilitate that with contractors and developers. Be on top of your paper. Um, you know, we have processes, we have reporting. But even if you're not doing work for us, uh, even if you're just doing work for a developer that doesn't touch city money, you know, being on top of paperwork, being responsive, um, being able to get documents back. Uh, it's critical because the, you know, the biggest challenge I think that um, people face is well, you know, we can't close this out because somebody didn't sign off a, uh, their lien. We can't close this out because somebody didn't click that they got paid. We can't sign this off because we're and it's it's you know, a lot of people do business. I mean, it's my I, mean, I work for the government, right? I mean, my job has a lot of paperwork too. I do business. I, I like my job because I like helping development happen, I like helping small businesses. I don't like doing, you know, paperwork, but I have to do paperwork. That's how I run, you know, that's how my office runs well. That's how we do make sure that we can document that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. You know, it's the same thing in your business. And so that ties into my next point. Uh, we have a, a ton of resources. We have a ton of partnerships that we can do that can help you get the help you might need. To, you know, you're, you're entrepreneurs, you're, you're starting, um, some of you have to think have been in business for 20 years, but a lot of you, you know, you're entrepreneurs, you're just trying to get started. Um, or, you know, you're good, you're good painters, but you're not so good at paperwork. So how can we help you get that set up? There's a, we have small business development centers in Cleveland. The Urban League runs one out of their building on Euclid. Um, the Hispanic Business Center runs uh, one. They're located at Clark and West 25th Street. Um, those are state-sponsored programs. Their whole existence is to help small businesses do what they need. So get you in connection with capital, help you figure out how to apply for a loan, help you figure out what you need to do to build credit, help you figure out what you need to do to document. That's what those uh, entities are for. If you got a question, if you're seeing something, you know, struggling with your business, uh, if you're just thinking about how I should be trying to write my proposal, or here's how I write my proposals, how can I do it better, reach out to those folks. Um, ECDI runs a program for microloans. If you need a little bit of money, a couple thousand dollars, just a small thing, um, but they can do that. Um, you know, they can do that so at, on your business, so you don't have to necessarily do it on your credit card or on a personal line. Um, Growth Capital is uh, one of the largest small business uh, lenders, SBA loans. Huntington Bank is the you've probably seen in the paper comes out every year. They're the largest or second largest SBA lender in the country. You're looking for capital, that's a great place to start. Um, capital Access Fund is a new fund that's run out of the Urban League, a partnership with National Development Council. It's focused on minority businesses, helping to provide capital, uh, access to capital uh, for those types of, for those businesses. In addition, you know, we're the Department of Economic Development, we have resources. 
we run a program called the SBA Muni program. Uh, when you go out and you get an SBA loan, uh, you have a 25% equity requirement. Well, you know, building equities, I'm sure you all know, it's not the easiest thing to do. So what we do is we help, we provide grant to help write down some of that 25% cost um, so that maybe a loan that you didn't think you could get, you can. Um, we have a program through EDA that provides low interest loans for working capital, for equipment, for inventory. Uh, the purpose of that program is to take loans where the banks either can't take the loan or they can't take you know, the full part of the loan. And so that program is designed for so if your bank, for, you know, that program is designed so if your bank says no, or your bank says we can't do the whole thing, that's what we're here for. Um, so please give us a call if you're looking at business expansion. Give us a call if you have capital needs. Um, we can help get you in contact with the, some of the programs I mentioned. We can help uh, with our funding. Um, we want to help you be successful. You're here because you care, because you want to grow your business, um, and we want to be able to help you with that. So that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. So thank you to Director Eversall, uh, really for identifying potential ways and most importantly additional resources that we as small businesses may need as well. Uh, some of his comments also led um, me to thinking about compliance and overall compliance. And at this point, I'd like to uh, have Michael Curry, the Assistant Director of OEO, come up and talk about what it is that we require in terms of overall compliance um, for the city of Cleveland. Michael? So the nice part about not you know, working with Director Burrell all the time is she doesn't have a list of stuff to talk about me before I come up here, so I don't have to be embarrassed by that. But what the Office of Opportunity does is first we certify businesses as minority-owned, female-owned, and Cleveland area small businesses, and we're going to do that with businesses that are going to work with the city or not. So we can talk about that a little bit more later, but understand that it's not just City of Cleveland projects that are actually falling under this larger compliance sphere. As Director Ebersole was saying, there's a lot of projects in the area that have city contributions as part of their overall financial plan. When the city invests in these local projects, they essentially become City of Cleveland projects for compliance purposes. That means they're going to have minority, female, and small business goals as part of those projects. We treat them, as far as our office is concerned, as if they are fully funded City of Cleveland contracts. Even if the city's contribution is just a small percentage of those projects. It's one of the things that we are doing as a city and as an office to sort of expand and provide more additional or more opportunities to our local small minority and female owned businesses. So when we do our compliance, what we're looking for at the beginning of the contract is a plan from those contractors. Who are those contractors going to use uh, as subcontractors on the contract? and what the approximate value of that subcontract is going to be. So when our contractors are coming to us with their project, whether it's a bid, whether it's a proposal, whether it's another type of development plan, they're going to give us a list of those subcontractors, who they are, where they're from, and the value of that subcontract. Over the course of the contract, we're going to monitor payments from the prime contractor to those subcontractors, making sure that they are doing work on the contract, that they're being paid for the work they're doing on the contract. We don't accept blind promises from our contractors. We expect those contractors to follow through over the course of the contract. And we're going to do that not just at the end of the contract, but every month over the course of the contract. How much did that prime contractor pay those subs? If they have second tier subs, did the first tier sub pay the second tier sub? We're going to follow those dollars to ensure that our contractors are meeting their obligations over the course of the contract. The other thing we're going to monitor is our, our use of Cleveland residents on our contracts. Uh, all City of Cleveland contracts valued at over $100,000 have a 20% City of Cleveland resident utilization requirement on the contract. That's not a goal, that's a requirement. So we have workers on projects, 20% of those worker hours are going to be done by City of Cleveland residents. We also have a low income resident requirement, that's 4% of the 20%. It's, it's, it's 8 hours for every 1,000 hours of work done on the contract. Again, these are requirements of projects that have more than $100,000 
of city investment. Our office is going to monitor the use of those Cleveland residents. We're going to collect certified payrolls from prime contractors and any subcontractors on the contract to track those hours. Total hours, resident hours, low income hours. And again, we're going to do that from the beginning of the project to the end of the contract. Any contract that fails to meet that obligation, there's a financial penalty for failing to do that. So that's what our office is going to do from a compliance perspective. We don't, or excuse me, we appreciate the efforts that the contractors put at the beginning of the contract, but we're going to make sure they follow through with the promises they make on those contracts. And as you are considering working as a, as a prime contractor, as a subcontractor, be aware of those obligations. We do our best to make sure that the contractor community is aware of what we need from them. But if you have, a con if you have contractors that haven't done work with the city before, it can be a surprise. They need to be made aware of those obligations. And, and sometimes they're not, they're not prepared to, to submit that information. Uh, they didn't realize we were going to follow up on that on those promises. And that's true of both prime contractors and subcontractors. Some subcontractors, and we've seen it uh, relatively often lately, is they're working on a private project. They're working for a Cleveland Clinic or they're working for just a, a private developer. They don't, they don't understand or appreciate that there's city dollars invested in that project. They don't understand as part of their obligation as a contractor, they're going to meet, need to submit this reporting as part of that process. So it, as a contractor, it's valuable for you to one, be aware of those obligations, to be able to tell your prime contractor, we know what we have to do, we're prepared to do that, we're not going to create problems for you on the back end. This director of all is paying. We've got projects that are complete that we would like to close out, but we're still waiting on some documentation from the prime contractor, from the subcontractor. If you as a subcontractor and submitting your reporting are the reason why your prime contractor hasn't been paid by the city for months down the line, that obviously reflects poorly on you as a contractor. Likewise, if you're a good kind, if you are good at reporting, you know you can get that information in. You've made things that much easier for your prime contractor. Incredibly valuable. Um, any questions on compliance stuff in general? If you need to be made, or if you need some training, some you'd like to be familiar with exactly what we do, the Office of Opportunity be happy to discuss that with you um, at any time. Uh, to tell you exactly what we do and, and how we're doing it. All of, our, all of our reporting is electronic now, so no paper is submitted to the Office of Equal Opportunity. We collect all that payment information, all that payroll uh, information electronically, and we'd be happy to discuss that with you as necessary. But there is a lot of work, both currently going and will be upcoming in the city of Cleveland. We've talked about billions of dollars worth of development. That number continues to grow as time moves on. It is important, and there are, there are opportunities for contractors right now. If you can get in on those contracts, there are dollars to be made. We set those goal percentages uh, as 15% minority, 7% female, and 8% and uh, Cleveland area small businesses on a vast majority of our development contracts. Given the scope of those projects, the dollars that are available that, are, that we're shooting for, we, we've established goals for, for the minority and female business community are very significant. And so there are opportunities coming down for contractors that can provide work on those contracts and, and work on those projects. Any questions about anything else? Yes, ma'am. Kind of the goals, like say for example, I'm a female and maybe say yes. would it count for both or do you, do you pick which one you need? So it kind of works both ways. So we. The, the most important thing is we're not going to count your number twice. Let me promise that. So we do like to use multiple contractors to satisfy multiple goals where we can. But we're always going to encourage contractors to use the best contractors for the work that they need to perform. So if you're part of a project and it, the prime contractor would like to use you for your minority business uh, category because they need to try to meet that goal, we'll do it for that. Likewise, for female business, even for small business. So we, we try to split it up as best we can to make sure that we get as many subcontractors engaged on the contract as possible, but you'll fall into one of those categories. And again, the overall goal is going to be separate. So essentially, if, you are, if your dollars are counted towards the MBE goal on a project, they're not going to be counted on the FBE goal so that we can, again, keep that full pool of potential subcontracting uh, as open. The last thing I want to talk about is community benefits agreements. So we talked about the city's projects. We talked about development projects that have city contributions. The last thing I want to talk about is that 
through signed community benefits agreements, a number of private owners are actually engaging in the same sort of goal setting and use of residents on their projects. So that means that Cleveland Clinic Project, University Hospital Project, Metro Health Project, in addition to a number of other private developers, are establishing City of Cleveland style goals on their contracts. They are setting for themselves goals on the use of minority businesses, female businesses, and small businesses. Goals for the use of Cleveland residents on their projects. And it's one of the, the things that we've been doing and, and the mayor's been doing to try to expand the use of our minority and female and small business community on projects that don't have public funds. And the way I bring that back to say, we do compliance and we track numbers and that's really important. But what we're really doing is we're trying to force the old institutions to utilize more contractors as part of their daily lives. And rather than just have it be a promise, this is a, we're going to track how you do that. We're going to encourage you to use minor, our minority and female business community, our small business community, and we're trying to push you into areas you haven't been before. Talk to new contractors, let them into your contractor pool rather than using the same contractors you've been used to using for a very long time. And by doing that, not just with the city funds, but with these private funds, we're hoping to grow that local minority and female business community. We believe that there are opportunities there, especially given the amount of work that's coming down, to grow that community, to keep those dollars local, and to grow business in the city of Cleveland. I think we've been generally successful, and I think we're going to continue to be successful as time goes on. Any questions about any of that? So I can only encourage you, please talk to people, network. There are opportunities out there right now. I realize that it can be difficult to make those connections, to get out of your shell, I know it's difficult for me anyway, um, to make those connections. But right now, we have contractors and developers actively looking for contractors. They are looking everywhere they can to find people that can work on their projects, not only just help them meet the goals, but to do the work they need to do. There's so much development happening here. We would like to keep that local. Because if they, if they can't find, if our contractors and developers can't find local contractors, they will go out of state because they need to get the work done. There's work coming. It's just a matter of who's going to be able to do that work. And we'd like to keep it as local as possible uh, for as long as possible. So what exactly are you doing to get out to the community and find these uh, contractors, minority and female contractors? Well, what I'm saying is, that, I mean, they are. Don't get me wrong. We just had a meet, uh, meeting yesterday uh, with a developer for a large uh, hospital project. And they have plans for open houses, outreach events, one-on-one -on -one meetings. And they're way ahead of the curve. Not everybody's there. Um, so I don't want to say that, so there are, you know, there are active plans, people reaching out to the local business community to try to establish these connections. Um, at the same time, they might not know how to find you. And so what I'm saying is by picking up the phone, by making those connections, there are, this is not a situation where if you go to somebody, they're going to tell you, I don't have any work for you. Because there is a lot of work out there. Now, again, depending on what you're doing. But the point is, is that contractors are now, it is a, for lack of a better term, a seller's market. It is a, it is a subcontractor's market that if you can provide work on these projects, there, are, there is more work than there is contractors. Or at least it, it's a lot closer than it usually is. So while we do have projects that do have a clear plan for how they want to engage the community and how they're looking for those contractors, what I'm saying is, is that those owners and developers are far more open to receiving new potential contractors because they need to find people to actually do this work. Um, so it is, it is a, again, there, there's a lot of work out there right now and contractors are looking for people to help them do that work. Any other questions? I'll turn it back over to Director Burroughs. Um, if you have anything, you're more welcome to talk to me. Let me thank each of you for coming. Uh, it was a rainy day, and it probably still is a rainy day, but that didn't stop you all from coming here. So we thank you very much for your attendance. I'd also like to thank Mr. Joe Lopez, Director Spranz, Director Eversol. I'd like to thank all of OEO's staff. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank Mayor Frank Jackson. And then, of course, also then, I'd like to thank uh, Chief of Public Affairs, uh, Chief Natoya walker Minor. Uh, and then finally, TV20 as well. So as you see, the city of Cleveland is really committed uh, to assisting you in any way that we can. We look forward to seeing you at our next quarterly contractors meeting. And again, if you have any suggestions for upcoming speakers, just please let one of us know. 
Have a wonderful Memorial Day holiday, and I can't leave here without saying, Go Cavs! Go Cavs! Yeah. <laughs>